Australia. In my very biased opinion, Australia is probably the most diverse country on the planet, and its continental neighbourhood of Oceania is the most diverse continent on the planet. I don't think there are many other countries that have deserts, savanna, woodland, forest, jungle, coral reefs, and mountains, all found on one landmass, which itself rivals the lower 48 US states in size. Kangaroos, cassowaries, emus, koalas, platypus, wombats, these animals are native to and only native to Australia. But that's not the focus of this video. As incredible as Australia is now, it used to arguably be even more incredible. Since the explorer, Captain Cook first stepped foot on the mainland of Australia in 1788, or 236 years ago, it is believed that as many as possibly a hundred species have gone extinct. That is a hundred birds, mammals, insects, amphibians, and reptiles that we might never get to see ever again. Probably the most famous is the thylacine, inaccurately called the Tasmanian tiger or Tasmanian wolf. Like the vast majority of mammals on the Australian mainland, the thylacine was a marsupial, closely related to dunnarts and numbats. It is believed that up until its extinction in 1936, it was the largest predatory marsupial on the planet. It is believed to have gone extinct 4,000 years ago on the mainland of Australia, and the last individual on the planet is believed to have died in 1936 in Hobart Zoo. This was likely from neglect, with the zookeepers likely keeping it outside during the blistering hot day of Tasmania and the freezing cold nights. A combination of heat stroke and hypothermia, along with very poor nutrition, likely contributed to this individual's death. Thankfully for us, thylacine might not forever be gone. The company Colossal Bioscience plans to resurrect a multitude of extinct animals, from the woolly mammoth to the thylacine to the dodo to the passenger pigeon. They plan to have a mammoth clone by 2020. 28. While true, these are not true clones because for that you need 100% of the genetic material. For the woolly mammoth, we only have a few specimens. We can bring it back through CRISPR-Cas9 or gene editing for short. This is where we just take small samples of DNA, swap them out with different Asian elephant traits like shorter tusks and less hair, and they'll replace those traits with more mammoth-like traits. While I can't find an exact date for the thylacine, considering it's a much smaller and less significant animal, it will probably be easier to clone, or at least resurrect in a way. Unfortunately for other extinct Australian megafauna, there are no current plans to resurrect them. So let's take a look at a few of these. The first of these marsupials we'll focus on is thylacolio or Thylacoleo, however you pronounce it. Now, I hear so many sources calling this the marsupial lion, but just like with the thylacine, that's an unscientific nickname, as the lions are, well, cats. And this is a marsupial closer to kangaroos and tree kangaroos. It is believed that this predator stalked the grasslands of Australia during the Pleistocene before 40,000 years ago. The main and most supported hypothesis on how these animals hunted was that they would have hunted on the tops of trees or along a branch, waiting for a herbivorous marsupial to come underneath the branch and for it to pounce using its sharp teeth, using them to pierce many of the vital organs such as the throat, heart or lungs. Now, the jaw of Thylacoleo looks a bit goofy, but it is believed to have been very deadly as a weapon, and it could have crushed a human's windpipe. The likes of Procoptodon and Diprotodon, two of the largest marsupials ever, were likely on its lunch menu. Diprotodon, if you're wondering, is the largest wombat ever, and largest marsupial ever for that matter. Diprotodon might have weighed as much as a car, and it was likely multiple folds heavier than the average human. Diprotodon has been discovered in many areas, I've actually been to one of these. Narracore Caves in South Australia is home to a variety of extinct Australian megafauna, such as the previously mentioned marsupial lion. Despite its size, Diprotodon was only the heaviest marsupial ever, not the tallest. Now, true, I can't find many sources on this, but from my research, the tallest marsupial ever, none other, Procoptodon goliath. Growing up to 10 feet or 3 metres tall, this was a relative of the modern-day kangaroos. 
Despite this, it has also been called the short-faced kangaroo. This is likely because this species had a very short face, or at least a very tall face, similar to, albeit more naturally occurring than, a pit bull, a bulldog, or a pug. One more very interesting aspect of this animal's life, which isn't similar to modern kangaroos, which can hop, obviously. You see, these kangaroos might have been a bit too heavy and likely didn't have the proper leg anatomy to hop, at least not for long distances. However, this animal likely wasn't grazing at all. This is probably because it was too tall to consider grazing a viable ecological niche. Instead, it may have been similar to giraffe which in modern times use their very, very long necks, sometimes over two metres long, to snatch leaves from the tallest of trees. Procoptodon goliath, although it likely didn't have a long neck, may have been able to use its hands and its arms to grab leaves with its paws, dragging it to their mouth similar to a ground sloth or a panda. Probably the most bizarre marsupial ever, was a nicknamed animal known as the marsupial ground sloth, or marsupial tapir. If you're wondering, its scientific name is Palocastes. This genus, like the others, lived around 40,000 years ago, with various individuals being found in Naracor caves. However, as the name ground sloth may imply, it likely used its tapir-like proboscis, there's a lot of debate on whether it had one, but whatever, to reach for the tallest of trees, rear up on its hind legs, and pull at branches. Likely similar to a ground sloth and the previously mentioned Procoptodon, Alorchestes was likely quadrupedal, and it was very bizarre looking, being able to literally sit down, similar to a human or a panda. And yeah, it is easily the most bizarre of these megafauna. Now, despite all of these incredible animals, most of them were likely eaten by Megalania priscus, or scientifically known as Varanus priscus. Now, I'm just going to quickly go into its classification. In previous scientific literature, Megalania was likely the genus name of the species. Priscus being the species name. However, if it were to be closely related to Komodo dragons, Varanus komodiensis, then it was agreed upon by the scientific community that it should be known as Varanus priscus, and Megalania could just be a common name. Megalania, or Varanus priscus, likely grew to around 1 ton maximum in weight, and grew to a maximum of likely 20 feet or 6 metres, making it about the size of a small cow, or around the same weight as the largest polar bear ever. Megalania was once believed to be so that its mouth would have literally been filled with saliva, growing an infectious bacteria. The hypothesis was that the animal would have bitten another creature, maybe a large marsupial, causing a bacteria to infect the animal's blood, causing it to eventually die. It would have easily rivaled Thylacolio as the largest apex predator Australia has likely seen since the dinosaurs. One of its preferred prey items may have been the various large flightless birds living in Australia at the time. Geniornus and Dormornus are believed to be two of the largest birds to ever live with the latter likely growing to 10 times the weight of an average human, with a maximum standing height of 3 metres. There's not really much to say on these ones, aside from the fact that they lived at the same time as the other megafauna mentioned previously, and again they've been found in the Narracourt cave sites of South Australia. However, Cenozoic deposits from Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, and Western Australia all show that the birds likely had a further range, possibly being two of the largest animals, yet two of the most diverse animals at the same time, inhabiting a wide range of environments. I'm going to talk about one more animal, Bohara, or Bohara. Again, a bit difficult to pronounce. This was a genus of macropod, and it may have been closely related to the tree kangaroos with a similar lifestyle. The only difference is that Bohara was much larger. The highest weight estimates I can find got to 47 kilograms. However, unlike all the other megafauna dimensions so far, these tree kangaroos likely did not live in the Naracor Caves. At the very least, not all species of the genus actually lived in Naracor Caves. Rather, some species have been found in Queensland and New South Wales, with some of their ranges roughly corresponding to modern tree kangaroos. Now, there are a few more megafaunal predators and other herbivores, like the leg 
Crocodile and Quincana, and a relative of Diprotodon, Zego Maturus. This video would have gone on for far too long if I were to explore each animal in detail. Ultimately, I feel like there's so much to explore in Australia. While you could say countries like India, China, and the US are more diverse in terms of environments, Australia arguably beats them. Because again, it has the outback, jungles, and snow all on one landmass. And something like, what, 99% of all other countries only have one environment throughout because they're too small to actually expand too much. Australia is truly one of one. Please don't forget to subscribe, leave a comment, and like the video if you actually liked it. See you next time. Bye.